man committed to the goals of forming a more... Good morning, and thank you for your time and your commitment to such a worthy undertaking. I'm Greg Merriweather, welcoming you to this year's Angola Museum Symposium on Race and the Louisiana Criminal Justice System. Our founding fathers, in establishing the new constitution of the United States government in 1789, committed to the goals of forming a more perfect union and establishing justice. As for equal justice, with regard to race, well, that wouldn't really start to appear until some 80 years later with the 14th Amendment. It, though, would be another 100 years before we'd see the enactment of groundbreaking civil rights legislation. The struggle of African Americans to get full rights and be valued as equal to whites has been an enduring struggle, to say the least. A critical component of that struggle has been the often painful relationship between African Americans Americans and the criminal justice system. Of course, equal justice under the law is a fundamental guarantee of the Constitution and American democracy, but yet in the real lived experiences of some African Americans, equal justice has been more of a constitutional promise than an achieved reality. The historic U.S. Supreme Court case in 1896 that ruled blacks did not enjoy citizenship rights equal to whites, of course, originated in Louisiana, the now infamous Plessy versus Ferguson. Until recently, Louisiana was one of only two states, with Oregon being the other, that did not require unanimous jury verdicts for criminal convictions. You don't need me to tell you that Louisiana has the highest sustained rate on incarceration in our nation. In fact, Louisiana leads the nation in no parole sentencing. As of last year, about 16% of our state's prison population consists of inmates serving life without parole. That is the highest percentage in the nation. This brief summary of racial dynamics in our state and nation provides a terrific segue into the Angola Museum's efforts today. The title of the symposium is In Pursuit of Equal Justice race and criminal justice in Louisiana, reconstruction, convict leasing, Jim Crow governance, and prison reform. Museums have an ethical obligation to educate the public on great issues of human affairs in our society. Now, consistent with that obligation, the Angola Museum, in its symposium, seeks to foster a discussion that accurately depicts what we've been through and where we hope to head. There is a lot to learn from Louisiana's painful history regarding race and the state's criminal justice system. The goal, though, is to create a criminal justice system which everyone will be treated equally. So I invite you to not just sit back and enjoy, but sit up and be engaged. This morning can be a start we all need. Thanks again for your time and your attention. And now we turn things over to your moderator. Hello, everyone. Excuse me, sorry about that. Hello, everyone, and welcome to In Pursuit of Equal Justice, Race and Criminal Justice in Louisiana, Reconstruction, Convict Leasing, Jim Crow Governance, and Prison Reform. We would like to thank you all for joining us today, as well as our panelists who are extremely excited to have with us here today. I would, for, I would also like to thank everyone behind the scenes that has helped us put this symposium together. It's been a great pleasure working with all of you. Thank you for joining us today as panelists discuss the facets of racial history during the Jim Crow era and the effectiveness of recent justice reforms aimed at producing a more just criminal, system, criminal justice system for all Louisiana citizens, particularly African-Americans and suggest ideas about what equal justice could look like in the future. Today's panel will examine the legal antecedents of mass incarceration and in doing two attempts to provide much needed clarity on the specific Louisiana criminal justice laws that have led to the high levels of mass incarceration in the state. Funding for the 2021 rebirth grants has been administered by the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities and provided by the Na National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the American Rescue Plan and the NEH Sustaining the Humanities through the American Rescue Plan Initiative. The views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this symposium do not necessarily represent those of either the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities or the National Endowment for the Humanities. 
Before we begin, there are a few items I'd like to go over. The first is that the, there will be time allotted after presentation, presentations for questions and discussions. If you have any questions for a panelist for that discussion time, please submit it into the Q&A uh, chat box at the bottom of the screen. Um, for any general information or questions that you have regarding the symposium series or tech problems, please use the chat and one of our support members will respond to you. At this time, I'm going to introduce our moderator for today, Dr. Annie Phoenix, who was recently hired as the Executive Director of the Jesuit Social Research Institute at the Loyola University of New Orleans, where she will lead faculty to contribute to le uh, criminal legal system reform and con continue the Jesuit tradition of faith that does justice. Take it away, Annie. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Um, and very excited to introduce panelists today, um, starting with our first panelist. I will say I do have a small child next to me, and she may contribute a couple uh, thoughts to today's discussion, hopefully not too many. Um, but I'm excited to introduce the first panelist, uh, Candice Malone. So Candice Malone is a 35-year-old first-time mom. She works as a part-time customer service representative, as well as an American Sign Language interpreter. She's a formerly incarcerated Black woman who has served 13 and a half years at Louisiana Correctional Institute for Women. During her incarceration, she began the second phase of her college studies as part of the Tulane University, where she's still pursuing a degree in social sciences. She is many things, but one of the most prominent things is that she will always be a survivor of domestic violence, which unfortunately led to her incarceration. Because of her survival, she will continue to be a voice for those who continue to suffer due to the discriminant gender laws of Louisiana. While she's a survivor of domestic violence, she continues to remain a victim of unfair laws of Louisiana that take away one's rights to defend themselves during domestically initiated danger, primarily based on gender. Thank you so much for being here, Candace, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Annie, for that warm introduction. Um, first, uh, greetings to everyone that's present on the panel. It is such an honor to be here to be able to speak today. I thank you all for inviting me. And I, like Annie, have my little one with me. She's asleep right now, so hopefully she won't contribute too much. First, I just want us to take a moment to think about why we are here and what we are discussing. We're here at the Angola Museum, virtually, of course. And we are, ob we are aware that there are obviously a problem with mass incarceration here in the state of Louisiana. However, the vast majority of this publicity surrounds itself around the men. I, as well as the women at the Louisiana Correctional Institute for Women, showcase a feminine aspect of mass incarceration here in Louisiana that often goes overlooked. And as we fought for equality years and years ago, I believe we fell into the system because if we wanna be equal to men on other levels, of course, we have to be equal to them criminally as well. And we have to also acknowledge that the prison system was designed to house men, black men mostly, once slavery was abolished, this was designed to house these men as a form of free labor, especially here in the South as a whole, there are many legal antecedents that add to the mass incarceration here in Louisiana from minimum to maximum sentencing as well as mandatory arrest. However, the one that stands out for me as well as women at LCIW is the lack of self-defense laws supported by battered women's syndrome here in Louisiana. We also have to acknowledge that there are a large number of women that are serving life sentences without the possibility of parole in cases that are more often than not related to domestic violence. In such cases where the woman actually did kill her abuser, her only reprieve for freedom is to serve out some kind of sentence, whether it be for manslaughter or second degree murder. I believe that this diminishes the value of a woman's life as it would appear that she does not have the right to defend herself. Legally, in these cases, battered woman syndrome, which I will refer to as BWS from here on out, is not an accepted defense, which would render psychological experts capable of answering 
the damning question of why didn't she leave? The burden of proof in these case, cases should fall on the courts. However, for women, the burden of proof falls on the woman to prove that she was indeed abused by her abuser. And as I said, I believe the burden of proof should fall on the courts to prove that the woman was not abused and that this is not a valid defense. And while this affects all women, as a woman of color, I have to speak out for the intersectionality of not only gender, but race here in Louisiana. Women of color are at vast disadvantage in these cases, ranging from lower income backgrounds and stereotypical views. We are viewed as an aggressive race of people. So we have to ask ourselves, why are women of color viewed as an aggressive race of people? And that would be, the reason for that would be, of course, that our counterparts are mostly incarcerated for crimes ranging from drugs to murder, you name it. And so we have to step into these roles of being not only the caretaker of our families, but also being the provider. A majority of our men, of course, are sitting in prison and that does force us to step into their role. And so stereotypically, we are viewed as an aggressive race. So if we present ourselves with this defense in court, it will not be accepted because they already see us as an aggressive people. And majority of us cannot afford proper legal representation. And while some of us sit in parish jails poorly designed for women, we do not have legal access to even to attempt to defend ourselves. For the men, they do have prisons that are designed for their holding before they actually go to court and are convicted of a crime. But women, we have to go to these parish jails where we barely have the necessities to take care of ourselves, let alone the legal access to be able to defend ourselves. I myself was lucky that I was able to bond out of jail and I had a paid lawyer, but that paid lawyer did none of the things necessary to present me with a proper defense. And I think that that is another problem that we lack here in Louisiana is that we don't have enough expert defense lawyers to help protect women because of the laws. There is no self-defense law. So the lawyer's hands are basically tied in being able to present a defense for these women. As a Black woman and a survivor of domestic violence and a previously incarcerated woman at LCIW serving life without parole, I know firsthand the injustices that we face concerning these sentences laws. Life without parole is not a fair sentence when in other states such as Alaska, that second degree murder carries five to 99 years. And while that may be excessive, there is a reprieve for the woman not to have to serve out the rest of her life in prison for defending herself. So the question is, where does one find the intent assigned to second degree murder when you are fighting for your life? Because that is the difference between second degree murder and manslaughter here in Louisiana. Second degree murder shows that you intended to cause physical harm to this person which resulted in their death. How does one assign that intent when you're fighting for your life? I mean, obviously you wanna defend yourself. You want to come out a survivor, never intending to actually harm or kill anyone. You just intend to protect yourself. And so those are the things that I believe that are a big contribution to the mass incarceration here in Louisiana. And um, in conclusion to what I've just stated, I compel those that do make the laws to look at the monstrosity of these mandatory sentences and apply special lenses to each individual case because no two cases are the same. Like I said, you have people from different backgrounds that commit crimes for different reasons, even when it comes to the men, you know, lower income families, they're doing the best that they can to provide for their families. And we have to take that into account and we have to consider the things that these people have gone through in their lives. And we need to start looking at battered woman syndrome as a proper defense here in Louisiana for domestic violent cases, as well as self-defense. 
And another thing that we should look at is the power of the prosecution to choose our proposed charges based on how they feel the case went. You know, even in my case, I was never psychologically evaluated once I was arrested. They never even considered the fact that I was in an abusive relationship, no matter the times that the police were called or the evidence that, were, that could have been presented to show that this was a case of domestic violence. And there's also another aspect I feel like I really don't have the time to speak on, but we need to look at the retroactivity of these laws. We are coming along and we've made better laws for these people, um, for women and men that are incarcerated as far as the non-unanimous jury. However, if you don't make that retroactive, that leaves hundreds, if not thousands of men and women still in justice, and that does not solve the problem of mass incarceration. And lastly, we also need to consider the resources available to women in prison to properly defend themselves. Again, I just want to thank you all for having me here. It has been a pleasure speaking. Um, thank you so much. And back to you, Annie. Thank you, Candace. And I'm looking forward to digging into some of those questions that you raised. Um, Al Alana, uh, I'm excited to introduce Alana Odoms as civil rights leader, mother, and professional and spiritual support to countless activists across Louisiana and beyond. As the first Black woman to lead the ACLU of Louisiana in its 65-year history, she has answered the call to defend the Constitution and the Bill of Rights by challenging systemic racism and gender injustice, vestiges of slavery displayed most prominently in Louisiana's epidemic of mass incarceration, immigrant detention and deportation, and racist policing across the state. Alana, we're very excited to have you here. I am really excited to be with you, Annie. So good to see you. And Candace, thank you so much for that really beautiful presentation. I am actually still learning about um, some of the laws impacting women with regard to self-defense and the great injustice that survivors of domestic abuse um, are facing with regard to the disparity in the law. So I just so much appreciate you bringing that perspective. I was actually just having a, a conversation with an attorney at the Tulane Law Clinic um, yesterday about the subject. So I feel like it was divine that you were presenting to us this morning. I have a presentation that I am going to be responsible for sharing. And I have notes, which is, y'all gonna have to really be, be very patient with me. So let's do a share screen here and pray that we get what we need to get up on the screen. Do y'all see this? Wow, look at that. Okay, wonderful. So let me just grab this because I realized I couldn't have my notes up at the same time if I'm also doing presentation. Um, okay, so what I have here is really, we're gonna be talking about the drivers of incarceration in the state of Louisiana, um, but we can't really talk about present day drivers of incarceration unless we actually really look back and we look at some of the historical um, contributors and policies that really have landed Louisiana as the top incarcerator in the world. And I will try to go over this briefly because I know we want to get to the some of the, the more present day um, issues. But we, um, when we look back, of course, we, you know, Candace spoke to us about the abolishment of slavery that marked the beginning of, of mass incarceration and imprisonment. And there is a very distinct relationship between slavery and mass incarceration, especially in the state of Louisiana. Uh, the passage of the Harrison Narcotics Act of 1914 um, was the official beginning of the drug war. So we've got lots of, you know, many presidents that have been kind of, you know, given like this uh, title, of, you know, uh, uh, who who created, you know, the war on drugs. And we know that with Nixon, where there, were, there, there was quite a lot happening out of course, during the Reagan administration, but this Narcotics Act actually prohibited doctors from prescribing opiates to folks who had substance abuse disorder because they literally said that it was not a disease. And so I really feel like I'm, I'm highlighting this point here because our criminal legal system is used to um, address mental health concerns and is, and is used to address concerns with substance use disorder. Whereas in countries around the world, that is not the case. And this is the origin of that. And most of the folks that we have incarcerated for lengthy sentences, as you would imagine, have both 
substance use, and also mental health uh, concerns. And so understanding this like very specific history is very important. Um, of course, uh, Reagan's um, Anti-Drug Abuse Act, you know, the whole Just Say No movement. And then of course we have uh, modern, more modern uh, laws and policies being passed uh, under the uh, Clinton administration um, and really laws that actually, the Clinton one strike rule actually led to generations of black and brown individuals combined to long prison sentences. And we really saw also with, uh, during the Clinton administration, different penalties for distributing crack cocaine versus powder cocaine. The federal sentencing guidelines, I think the disparity between crack and powder cocaine used to be like 100 to one, and then it was um, amended, and now it's something like 17 or 18 to one. But you really see stark disparities in the way that African-American people are treated um, with regard to sentencing in the criminal legal system. So I'm going to move to my next slide, which I actually very proud of myself that I was able to, <laughs> to move that forward. Um, so essentially what we've seen is a skyrocketing uh, prison population in Louisiana. If this graph went a little bit further in 2017 and 2018 and 2019, you would, have, you would see this graph line start to decrease. And that would be as a result of the work of a lot of people who are actually on this panel and other panels with the Justice Reinvestment Act. Uh, and that started essentially in 2015 or so, at least the research end of it, where we did a wholesale um, study of the drivers of incarceration in Louisiana and really saw that for the most part, our incarceration rates were driven by the fact that we incarcerated more people per capita than any of our southern neighbors. Virtually, we have the same crime rates or had the same crime rates at that time, but we're incarcerating more people for low-level nonviolent offenses more than any other state. And we also, of course, had very high rates of recidivism, more than one in three people returning to prison within three years, um, but yet still incredibly draconian sentences, mandatory minimums, um, habitual offender statute and other drivers of incarceration that really um, disproportionately impact uh, people of color, of course, and of course, women. There, there are so many um, harms that we have in, in our particular system in Louisiana. It's very, very hard to target one specific area. It's kind of like a cancer that has metastasized across the entire system. But there are a few um, key places, and uh, I hope Biddish doesn't take any offense to this because I too am a former prosecutor, but um, vesting discretion within prosecutors, I think 95% of whom across the state, but also across the nation, um, who are elected, who are traditionally um, white, uh, traditionally come from uh, more conservative backgrounds, uh, investing or vesting full discretion uh, for, uh, you know, the imposition of certain penalties, for example, the habitual offender statute, which we've, which is a key driver of incarceration in Louisiana is very problematic. Um, and that's one of the drivers of incarceration, something that we um, have been trying to work through and think about the ways that we can both balance uh, providing discretion to judges who also have problems with the ways in which they sentence uh, with the discretion that prosecutors have. And then racial disparities. Um, we, we are very comfortable with sentencing people to life, with, life in prison without parole. It's the, it's the mandatory penalty for second degree murder as well as first degree murder. We have extremely long sentences, virtual life sentences that result a, from the habitual offender statute. Some of these sentences even impact people who've committed nonviolent offenses. And I think that the heart of this conversation, we would miss everything if we don't actually, if we don't name this issue, which is anti-Black racism. We would not be okay sentencing over 5,000 people to life in prison without parole if we weren't okay that most of those people would be Black and Brown. And the idea that we can simply incarcerate ourselves out of a crime problem, 
that we can sentence people to more and more punitive sentences and that that has an impact, a positive impact on crime rates is simply not true. And we'll talk about that a little bit further in the presentation. Um, let's see. These are the, the uh, top offenses that people are incarcerated for in the state of Louisiana. Um, as you see, second degree murder is um, high on that list. Um, but of note, I think, is the fact that Schedule Two, possession of Schedule Two, and then also these firearms charges and other charges that have mandatory minimum sentences. Um, so I, I spoke about the fact that second degree murder uh, has a mandatory uh, penalty of life in prison without parole. We are one of only two states, us in Pennsylvania, that require um, mandatory life without parole for second degree murder. Um, most other states have parole eligibility. It, it's a range, but somewhere between 20 and 30 years. And uh, we are an outlier uh, in that regard. Um, we also see that um, you know, an incredibly large population of people are serving time in Louisiana's jails and prisons for substance use disorder and for, for possession of narcotics, which we've seen many states across the country defelonize a certain drug possession and really start to really reduce levels of incarceration for people who have not harmed anyone, for people who are facing um, substance use disorder. And we have not done that. And we continue to have very harsh penalties for, um, for individuals uh, who possess narcotics in this state. And I think we, we will, we've got to do two things. We have got to, we have got to reckon with how we handle uh, cases where individuals have been harmed, so instances of violence, and we have to look at the diminishing rate of return on prison, why we sentence people to hundreds of years in prison or life sentences, not providing opportunities for redemption when most other states in the nation do, and really essentially eliminating all opportunities for people to redeem themselves. So if we don't actually reckon with violence, we are not going to be able to address this problem. And as I've said, we also have an obsession with incarcerating people for crimes of poverty, mental health, and substance use disorder. Uh, life in prison without parole. Um, I, I commented on this, um, and I think the number is even higher. Um, now, I think there are more than 5,000 people serving life in prison without parole in Louisiana. Might be closer to 6,000. Um, Keith or Biddish might have um, some additional numbers there. But um, Louisiana's life without parole sentencing, um, the nation's highest. And it, it is, it's really unthinkable. And it, we, we have, again, we would not be as comfortable with the number of people serving life in prison without parole, if we weren't comfortable that those uh, people who were gonna be incarcerated were majority black and brown and women. And so we, if we're going to reckon with this, we have to reckon with the piece of our system that is tied quite directly to slavery and to realize that unless we actually study uh, these, these issues with a lens of racial justice, not simply aligning ourselves with other Southern partners, which is a lot of what we talked about with justice reinvestment, but this is actually getting to the heart of the system and why as a, as a state who, that sold more black people uh, at the auction block into slavery, that we are again, the highest incarcerator in the world and, and not recognizing the, the very direct correlation and relationship there. Um, again, we, this is just a little bit more information about uh, folks serving life in prison without parole, the highest percentage of folks serving that sentence. It's increased since the state's 2017 criminal justice reform. And I think that's also really important to, to, to point out and highlight that we, I think as a state, we did ourselves a real disservice 
uh, in the 2017 reforms. Unfortunately, um, there was a line drawn in the sand very early in the conversation where all of the reforms that were proposed that impacted uh, people who had committed crimes of violence or at least crimes that were determined to be crimes of violence under 14.2, all of those reforms were taken off the table. We, we proposed many changes to mandatory minimum laws. Uh, we proposed many changes to uh, life without parole. We proposed many changes that were simply completely disregarded. We were, uh, the political environment was one uh, where the legislature would, would only agree to entertain those reforms that impacted um, individuals who had who were considered nonviolent, and that that's a huge missed opportunity. And if we are ever going to see a change or decrease in the overall incarcerated population, we have got to reckon with violence, and we have to reckon with our with anti-black racism in this. Uh, criminal legal system and excessive draconian sentences, even for crimes of violence. So the habitual offender statute, I've referenced it several times. We've been trying to make reform and have kind of been, you know, making some efforts around the edges to reform the habitual offender statute. Um, we were told that you know, the habitual offender statute is only used in the worst of the worst cases. Um, it's used for, you know, folks who have committed serious crimes of violence. But of course, further study revealed that 64% of convictions under the habitual offender statute were for nonviolent offenses. And 31% of those convictions were for drug offenses. And so we've, we've tried many times at the legislature to prevent or just essentially remove certain categories of offenses. Well, we don't even have categories of offenses. That's another problem with our, um, our statutes here. We've, we've tried to eliminate the opportunity to use nonviolent offenses or drug convictions to be enhanceable offenses. And that is not something that we've been able to accomplish. It's still something that needs to be done. The look back period was what we actually uh, addressed during the 2017 reforms. And essentially we reduced that as much as possible, which means that a DA cannot look back 10, 15, 20 years uh, to an offense that was committed uh, decades and decades ago, but rather has to look back more recently. Um, and that has, a, a, I think, partially uh, curb some of the systemic injustice, but there is still um, so much more to go. Um, you know, I really think that, you know, this, there's, there's so much that's done at the legislature that is reactionary, um, that is not based in evidence, not based in any research, is just based on fear and racism. And uh, the benefit of um, spending time kind of studying criminological evidence and research for a couple of years while we were working on justice reinvestment, <clears throat> we combed over many, many, many studies that show an inverse relationship between increased levels of incarceration and recidivism. So the the it's it's almost exactly the inverse like what you would think would help impact public safety by incarcerating people more and more and for lengthy and lengthier and lengthier sentences exa is exactly the opposite uh, be your prison actually is a place that is not supportive unless you actually put certain programs in place to help rehabilitate people um it is not a place um to spend 10 or 15 or 20 or, or 30 years, there's a diminishing rate of return on it. We have many different reasons why we punish people. Um, punitive uh, reasons are, of course, one of those reasons. You just want to hurt someone. You just want to hurt them in the way that they hurt someone else. But deterrence is also a, a reason for punishment. And long sentences do not deter people from committing crime. That is, that is a fact, and it's very well researched. The certainty of a punishment is more of a deterrent to someone committing a crime than the severity of a punishment. So the fact that someone is incarcerated for five years versus 10 years, the certainty that they will be held accountable is something that is more impactful in terms of whether or not someone thinks about or does in fact decide to commit a crime 
And that's uh, something that we don't account for in our current sentencing scheme. Um, we don't also account for the fact that um, people age out of committing crimes. There's a there's an early period in your life somewhere between um, you know early teenage years and late twenties, early thirties, where because of brain development and because uh, of of increased you know of risky activity younger people tend to commit crime, but after a certain period of time, that risk goes down dramatically. And so sentencing people to decades and decades in prison beyond uh, those early 30 years is very, very ineffective and, and really doesn't result in the kind of outcomes that we want to see, um, diminishing rate of return on prisons. And and frankly, this is the, la the last point I'll make is that, you know, we saw all of these draconian laws and mandatory minimums and habitual offender statute and life in prison without parole, removing parole eligibility, all of those things happened in, you know, during the course of time with the war on drugs. And they were supposed to create greater public safety and less victims and all of that. And yet here we stand with incredibly high crime rates. Uh, we had diminishing, you know, crime rates that were, were going down for, for, for a while, but they were not as a result of these draconian rules. They were as a result, when you actually invest in community alternatives, alternatives to prison, when you actually support people with mental health uh, disorder, when you actually help provide housing and um, uh, support for substance use, community-based services. These are the kinds of things that really help to support people, not incredibly long sentences. So I think we should be looking back at that history to see we've had these. We've had these terrible practices before. They didn't make us any safer. And so we really owe it to ourselves to do something different uh, in the future. And I really think that working with prosecutors prosecutors like Biddish and like uh, DA Williams and Emily Ma and others who have been working in the space of uh, criminal legal reform for decades and really have an investment in eliminating racial disparity, reducing mass incarceration. Those are the kinds of partners that we need because if we're simply going back and asking the same crop of legislators or folks with that same kind of mentality and individuals who believe that incarceration is the way to solve this problem. If we're just going back to those same wells and asking those same people to change their perspectives, that's a very difficult, that, that's almost impossible. We have to be partnering. We actually have to have more people um, who have a social justice background, who involve themselves in running for DA and running for sheriff and running for uh, positions in the legislature. That's why redistricting is so important, um, so that we can have a more um, deeply grounded conversation in the evidence and with recognizing our history. And uh, that's all I have to say about that. Thank you so much, Alana. Thank you, and I'll stop my screen share. Gotcha. Hopefully. <laughs> Thanks. All right, well, we're really looking forward to digging into that. Uh, next, we have Abhidesh Sharma, who spent more than 10 years of his career representing people facing death sentences and life sentences in Louisiana and a few other Southern states. Last year, he joined the newly created Civil Rights Division of the Orleans Parish District Attorney's Office, where he's working as part of a team to redress excessive sentences and wrongful convictions. Looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thanks, Annie. Um, and it's nice to meet you. Uh, I'm look, looking forward to working with you soon. Um, I I have prepared a presentation and I'm gonna try to get to it, but I realized I'm um, listening to Candice and listening to Alana, uh, whose presentations I'm grateful for, uh, that I have a lot to say. Um, and I, I think the thing that they said that I really wanted to touch on at the beginning is the importance of the power of the prosecutor. Um, Jason Williams, uh, the district attorney in Orleans Parish, uh, gave a presentation yesterday uh, on March 24th. For, so for those of you who are interested in finding out more about uh, what the platform he ran on and what he's been trying to accomplish in his role as the district attorney, I'd really encourage you to go back and watch that video once they get posted on YouTube later. 
Uh, but one thing he did is he created a civil rights division um, and uh, it's a real division in the office. It's staffed well, we have resources and we are trying to do some of the work of undoing the past harms of going back and actually looking at people who are already incarcerated. And obviously it's very important to do front to end reforms to think about how we're gonna sentence people going forward to think about how to you know, reduce the punishments that we're handing down for low level offenses. Taking those steps is really important. But the problem is when we don't look back, we, have, we already have a mass incarceration problem. We already have four to 5,000 people serving life without parole sentences. We already have a full, many full prisons in Louisiana. And the only way to really address the, 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 that problem meaningfully is to look back. Uh, and I thought I'd just tell a really quick story about what's uh, one thing that happened today. Um, and this is becoming a more typical day for us at our office. But um, I went to court this morning with one of the law school interns who's been working in the civil rights division. Uh, and we addressed a case where uh, a man has, has, as of today, been incarcerated for over 22 years on the, the conviction for the distribution of marijuana and possession with in, uh, intent to distribute marijuana. And what happened in his offense is that two undercover police officers uh, found somebody out on the street in the French Quarter, asked him if he knew how he could get some weed. That guy went into a bar, found the defendant in the case, asked, basically found out that this guy had some pot on him uh, and coordinated. So the defendant in the case went outside and basically gave the undercover cops uh, roughly about 10 to $20 worth of weed. Uh, based on that exchange, he got arrested. This is in 1999, he got arrested. Uh, the state in the case decided to file a multiple bill, or in other words, to invoke the habitual offender law, which is something Alana talked about a lot. And the prior convictions that they used in order to enhance the sentence or they, that, that the state sought to use in this case, one was a marijuana possession offense, another one was a marijuana possession offense, and the third one was something called a crime against nature felony, which basically meant that he had a same sex conviction. Uh, those, those types of convictions were deemed unconstitutional by the US Supreme Court in 2003, but he had uh, gotten this offense in 1983. So these were the offenses that the state was trying to use to enhance this person's sentence. Ultimately, his sentence was enhanced. He received a 25 year sentence for selling $20 worth of weed. Today, we got to go to court and Brandon Bonds, the student I was supervising, was able to withdraw the multiple bill using the power of the prosecutor to undo something that was done before, remove the enhancement and allow this individual who had done over 22 years to go home. Uh, so hopefully later today, Mr. Miller will be on his way home. Uh, and this is the kind of work that it's going to take uh, to, to do the work that everybody has identified as us needing to do. And I hope that there's more of a consensus that we need to do these things. Um, but I just wanted to give a sense of what we are trying to do. Um, I have a more slightly more academic um, presentation to give and I'll get into it. But um, I just to give a more uh, full explanation of what the Civil Rights Division in Orleans Parish is trying to do. Um, over the past year or so, we've tried to address several cases where the habitual offender law was invoked. I believe as of today, including the case I just mentioned, we have addressed about 56 cases where we've basically removed the enhancement and allowed somebody to be resentenced to something more reasonable. In 11 of those cases, people had actually gotten life without parole sentences for non-homicide offenses. Uh, I think five of those people, for example, had purse snatching convictions that ultimately led them to get life without parole sentences. Uh, we've also you know, done traditional work that conviction integrity units around the country do, which is to ensure that there aren't any wrongful convictions in the jurisdiction. We have a lot of wrongful convictions in Orleans Parish. And over the past year, the division has exonerated or helped exonerate five individuals. Um, and I wanted to mention one of those cases specifically because it touches on a lot of what Ms. Malone was talking about when, when Candace was talking about uh, how our laws insufficiently recognize self-defense, especially in the context of Black women who are in uh, abusive relationships or suffering in domestic violence and intimate partner violence situations. Uh, a woman named Betty Broaden had been uh, convicted and sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. She had been in prison for 38 years. There was no dispute in her case that the person that she ended up killing had actually come into her apartment and sexually assaulted her the night that she ended up killing him. That was undisputed. Uh, nevertheless, the state at the time that she was prosecuted decided it was appropriate to seek a second degree murder conviction. Uh, as Candace and Alana have explained, that's a mandatory life without parole sentence. Ms. Broaden had been in prison for almost four decades uh, and our office was able to work with uh, alongside the women's prison project at the Tulane Law Clinic to see that her conviction was undone and that she was exonerated because what she did was not a crime. 
She did not commit a criminal offense. She shouldn't have been prosecuted. Uh, and the evidence was clear about that from the start. There was no dispute about that. Um, and that's that's another way that, that you know, we need people to go back and look at cases like this. Um, we've also, uh, uh, you know, been trying to address on a case by case basis in the way that um, Ms. Candace mentioned earlier, try to address the cases where somebody has a non-unanimous jury conviction. Uh, and that's something that the DA addressed yesterday uh, and spoke at at more length. Uh, so I'd encourage folks who are interested to go back and listen to what he had to say. Uh, and we've also looked back at cases where people have life without parole sentences for offenses that were uh, committed over 40 or 50 years ago. Uh, there's a category of individuals in Louisiana who uh, were actually sentenced to life at a time when a life sentence meant something very different than what it means today. Um, you know, from 1926 to 1979, getting a life sentence in Louisiana meant that you could actually be eligible for release if you uh, had good behavior while you were incarcerated after 10 years and six months. And many people across the state, uh, including more than a dozen, almost two dozen in Orleans Parish, had either pled guilty or gone to trial and gotten a life sentence under this legal regime that was in, a, in effect. Uh, these, these folks were incarcerated you know, since the late 1960s into the 1970s. And our office has tried to systematically go back and give them the benefit of, of, the, real life, the, of the life sentence that they received, uh, what it was understood to be at the time. Those people never anticipated being in prison for five decades. Most or all of them are remarkably rehabilitated people uh, and deserve a chance to at least live the last few years of their lives as free people. Uh, and that's something that our office has tried to do. So um, it's, suffice to say, you know, the prosecutors do have a lot of power uh, and it has, I think, been abused in a lot of ways and created, um, created the mass incarceration problem we're seeing. But I do think we can be a tool, not the, not ex not the exclusive tool, but I think the prosecutor's office can be a really important tool to, to, to starting a fix uh, and to make meaningful change. So I would love to talk about uh, our work more if people are interested. I do think it's probably the most responsive thing I could talk about. Um, I wanted to add a little bit to what Alana presented in terms of the legal antecedents that have led us to the mass incarceration crisis that we see today. Um, so I'm gonna talk about a specific aspect of that and I will try to share my screen to do that. All right, I think I'm sharing a screen here. Can everybody see my, my all text slides? I'm not very good at uh, making slides, but um, I wanted to just provide a really quick framework for how I, I to think about the mass incarceration crisis and why we've ended up here. And I think the historical framing that this symposium has provided and that both Candace and Alana have provided really explain you know, how what's happened in the 1800s and the 1900s have, have led us to a terrible place. Um, but, but to break down the ways that mass incarceration continues to happen in the United States, uh, you know, I've ident identified these five different ways of thinking about it. I think one is the number of criminal laws and the scope of those criminal laws. So that's the first point here is that the expansion of the criminal laws has really contributed to the mass incarceration crisis. We criminalize lots of things in the US uh, that arguably do not need to be criminalized. Uh, the second is the extension and expansion of criminal punishment. Uh, and this gets to the sentencing point that Alana made so well. We have extremely long sentences. We have mandatory sentences. These are things that are gonna make our prison population unnecessarily large. Uh, there's the curtailment of legal avenues to relief. Basically, this is you know stripping people who have been incarcerated for crimes, uh, the opportunity to avail themselves of legal remedies uh, that could either shorten their sentences or help them challenge their convictions. There is the abuse of enforcement discretion. Um, as Alana mentioned, prosecutors have discretion. As Candace mentioned, police have discretion. The way that they use those discre that discretion uh, can lead to discriminatory results and has done that. Uh, and the thing I wanted to talk about specifically today are limitations on democratic participation in the process, in the administration of criminal justice. Um, I, in, in 2012, I co-wrote a paper that was published in the Louisiana Law Review called How and Why Race Continues to Influence the Administration of Criminal Justice in Louisiana. Um, it's 10 years old, but unfortunately it's still pretty relevant. Um, so if anyone is interested, uh, you know, feel free to look that up or, or get in touch with me later, I'm happy to share it. But a lot of the ideas that we uh, put forth in that paper are what I'll talk about now. And I do think if, uh, for those of you who were watching the, the panel yesterday, uh, Professor Aiello's uh, thesis about how 
we have a lot of racist laws that were passed in the 18 and 1900s that continue to be in effect today, even though the people today don't see them as being discriminatory or see them as having an intended racially disparate um, uh, purpose. Um, they were actually enacted with those things in mind, and we need to have a critical and historical lens to understand that. A democratic participation in the criminal legal system is a core principle in American democracy. Uh, it's really important, and I think about it in two ways. One is we elect uh, legislators to decide what the laws are. So we are electing the people who are creating hundreds and hundreds of criminal laws that continue to expand the criminal code. They decide the sentencing ranges. The legislature is the one that, you know, is the responsible body for effectuating uh, the laws that we find ourselves with now. And we can hold them democratically accountable. Um, and then secondly, uh, democracy matters in the criminal justice system because individuals have a constitutional right to a jury trial and they have the right for people in their community to be a part of the decision making process in their case. The problem, however, is that there have been real limitations put on the, the access um, uh, that's been provided to people in our system to, to participate. And so on the, on the legislative side, the box constraints and Probably the best example of those constraints are the way the ways in which the state has disenfranchised people with felony convictions. Uh, and I am not an expert on this. Uh, this is something that Norris Henderson and the folks who work with Vote know a lot about. And I would really encourage people to consult their materials and work with them if they're interested in this issue. But essentially, today, for people who who have felony convictions on their record, uh, who might have completed their prison terms, as long as they're on probation and parole, they're still going to be unable to vote. And you know, we talk about the, the, the incarceration problem, but there's also a mass supervision problem. We have tens of thousands of people who are under supervision or on probation and parole, and those people aren't going to be able to cast a ballot to, you know, register their vote. Uh, and, and then the, the main point uh, I want to talk about is jury box constraints. Um, how do we actually get people uh, in, in the jury box uh, who can provide a, a real, you know, community point of view? Uh, there are a lot of different constraints. Uh, Non-unanimous jury verdicts are one, uh, and that was discussed at length on the panel yesterday. Uh, another is the discriminatory use of peremptory strikes, which I'll talk about. Uh, summonsing practices, which is something that Professor Angela Bell spoke about yesterday, uh, and depth qualification in capital cases. Uh, and I'll just describe these briefly, and then if folks want to have a longer conversation or have any questions, um, please feel free to raise them. With respect to the discriminatory use of peremptory strikes, a peremptory strike is basically a strike that either party can use when they're picking a jury in a criminal case. And a strike means that you basically exclude someone from the jury. So, you know, as you go in and, and you're doing jury service, you get called up to the courtroom, the parties start asking you some questions, and then they get to decide uh, whether or not they want you to be a part of the jury. And each side tends to get something like 12 peremptory challenges. Uh, the US Constitution prohibits parties from using race as a basis for deciding whether or not somebody can be a part of the jury. But that, that constitutional uh, constraint doesn't actually come into play very often um, because it's really difficult to prove that somebody has excluded a prospective juror on the basis of their race. But we know, looking at study after study, that Black prospective jurors in Louisiana are struck at a much higher rate than white prospective jurors. Uh, there was a study conducted in the early 2000s by the Louisiana Capital Assistance Center called Black Strikes, which showed that prosecutors in Jefferson Parish were striking Black jurors at, you know, nearly four to five times the rate that they were striking white prospective jurors who were similarly situated. Uh, and I believe in 2011, the Equal Justice Initiative also issued a report on this topic. Uh, a less uh, interesting or sexy topic, but a really important topic is uh, under-inclusive summonsing. Uh, Professor Bell talked about this, but if you really want the jury to represent the community, you need to think about how you call those jurors to come to court. And so there are questions about how does the local jurisdiction actually construct the jury pool? What lists are they using? Are they only looking at the list of registered voters? Because that can be under-inclusive in certain predictable ways. Uh, and how often is that list refreshed? Uh, it was interesting, uh, I saw in the news a couple of years ago that the 19th Judicial District actually, it was discovered in a criminal case that they hadn't summonsed anybody who was born after the year, uh, after the month and year of June 1993, from 2014 to 2018. So over a four-year period, a, a pool of eligible voter, uh, el eligible jury participants was completely excluded because the system wasn't working and the system wasn't set up to function properly. 
Uh, and the last issue I wanted to touch on in cat cases. The death qualification essentially is um, a requirement that somebody who is uh, showing up for jury service in a death penalty case is able to actually hand down both a death verdict and a life verdict. But in order to get on the jury, you have to be able to say that I would impose the death penalty in a particular case, that I would be able to consider it. So people who have conscientious scruples against the death penalty are excluded. And um, this disproportionately excludes Black prospective jurors and people who have doubts about the fairness of the criminal justice system. And the reason I raise it is because the state is not required to have death qualification be part of its practice. It's completely optional, but Louisiana has made the choice to require death qualification, meaning uh, people who are skeptical about state authority are systematically removed from death penalty cases. And I'll finish up by just mentioning the results of this. Uh, there's systematic underrepresentation of Black people on juries in Louisiana. The process is less fair. There's tons of research that shows more diverse juries reach better conclusions and they deliberate better. We've got the erosion of the idea that the jury would represent uh, your peers. You know, you would have a, a, a jury of your peers to help decide whether or not you were guilty of an offense. I think arguably we've got harsher results for people who are charged with crimes. Uh, and lastly, we've got a mass incarceration crisis, which we've all identified and greater racial disparities. Um, so I think it's not just the laws, but it's how those laws get enforced and uh, the public's access to participating in the process that make a difference. And I just wanted to highlight some of the ways that that happens. Thanks. Thank you so much for your presentation. All right, next I'm introducing Keith Nordek. Keith was appointed as class counsel in the Louisiana prison reform cases by the federal court and served in that role representing thousands of people in prison for many years. Following termination of the reform litigation, Keith has spent the last 20 years engaging in prison, pardon, and parole practice, <laughs> and also has taught these subjects as an adjunct faculty at LSU Law Center. Additionally, he was the project director for the Tiger Risk Research and other research regarding recidivism of long-serving people in prison. Thanks, Keith, for being here. Thank you. Um, let me start by saying, as I prepared for this, I didn't realize I had actually lived history, but when you start to think about this stuff, I have lived through a, a, an extended period of history. And I think that changes the lens through which I wish to present this. Uh, I don't wanna tell this as a bunch of war stories because I could do that for days. So I wanna think as a historian and present this more as a historian. And I, I don't have limited time. So what I need to do is take roughly 50 years of history and condense it to 10 minutes or so. And that's what I'm gonna to try to do. So forgive me folks, if I leave out your favorite part of this story, it's not intentional, it's just I don't have enough time. So let me start with a question. Who was Hayes Williams and why should you care? We'll talk about Hayes more as we go through this, but uh, it basically has taken us 50 years to get to where we are today. When when, when Moses had to wander for, for 40 years in the desert, there was a reason for that. That was so that the previous generations could die off and the unbelievers would die off. And only those that were uh, involved in the new way of doing things could enter the promised land. And I think to a very large degree, that's what our prison reform litigation has done for us. So let me start with a tale of Louisiana prisons and how we got from basically just Angola, the bloodiest prison in America, to where we are today. In the beginning, there was Angola and there was LCIS, which is Louisiana Correctional Industrial School. And that's the redheaded stepchild of, of correction. So let's not even talk about LCIS. They didn't handle enough people to be uh, part of this at that time. The population was somewhat limited, 4,000 at most at Angola. And in 1971, an African-American inmate by the name of Hayes Williams was unhappy with the conditions of confinement at Angola and filed a handwritten lawsuit, handwritten lawsuit in federal court in Baton Rouge. It was assigned to a young magistrate, Frank J. Palazzola, and Judge Palazzola, under orders from District Judge E. Gordon West, took evidence over a two or three year period. He went to Angola constantly. Uh, Judge Palazzola would tell stories later of, 
every time he went, they would roll out a new body in a, in a laundry cart because both the free man and the convicts did not want this change that they knew was coming. So they would kill another person as a sacrifice to the gods that be and, and uh, present it basically every time Judge P would go up there. Additionally, Judge Palazzolo told a story of catfish fingerlings being found in the, uh, in the whirlpool that they use for physical therapy. He told a story of uh, an inmate in the emergency room at NGH, the, the hospital up there, um, doing suturing. And this inmate's only claim to fame medically was that he had worked as a janitor in a mortuary. So he had watched some suturing going on in that mortuary. And he also told of a pill call being conducted by an inmate who was illiterate. And he handed out pills based on the color of the pill. That's how the pills got, uh, got handed, distributed. So all of this, including, including segregation, by the way, which was a major factor in this decision, Judge Palazzolo rendered a sweeping, sweeping decision in the mid 70s, which found Angola unconstitutional. Judge E. Gordon West, uh, who was the district judge, approved it, saying no right-minded human being would accept this. Um, and let me tell you, e. Judge e. Gordon West was no liberal. Um, I knew him. He was not a liberal by any stretch of the imagination. And he, in, he implemented significant reform, sweeping reform. He put population caps on Angola so there wouldn't be overcrowding. He ended trustee guards. We call them khaki backs uh, because of the clothes they wore. And actually, Elaine Hunt uh, ended that program in the early 70s. He imposed ratios of corrections officers to inmates so there wouldn't be uh, as many stabbings and killings as there were at Angola. He Im imposed medical uh, qualifications. Disciplinary board uh, were, were created so there would not be arbitrary and capricious discipline. And finally, uh, one of the most important things that happened was desegregation of Angola occurred. And it occurred actually in one day and nonviolently. There wasn't a single, uh, to my understanding, not a single uh, mishap during that, that switch. So the subject to this, this whole symposium is mass incarceration. How does this fit into mass incarceration? And the answer is, at this point in history, it doesn't because there was no mass incarceration at this point in history. The state response to Judge Palazzola's ruling was what you might expect the state of Louisiana or any Southern state to do, and that is to oppose it, to, to, to kick and scream and say, not us, we're not gonna do that. Uh, we like the way we've been doing that. And of course the US Fifth Circuit said, no, you're gonna do it. And they did in fact, state finally started implementing the reforms that Judge Palazzola ordered. By the late 70s, by the late 70s, the state of Louisiana had accepted the writing on the wall and they had begun a hiring spree and a building spree. Angola was originally run with just two or 300 people. It was being run by, by prisoners. So a hiring spree occurred, hundreds and hundreds of people were hired. A building spree occurred both at Angola, but more importantly for us, it was decentralizing Angola. Hunt Correctional Center came online, Dixon Correctional Center, uh, Avoyles Correctional Center, Cottonport, uh, Washington Correctional Center, WCI, WNC, Wynn Correctional Center, uh, ALC, Allen Correctional Center, Wade Correctional Center, and a host of smaller camps uh, that, that, that came online. Again, not because of mass incarceration, just because Judge Palazzolo said you had to. The DOC finally had a boogeyman in the form of Frank Palazzolo that they could play off of. And that made a significant difference at the legislature. The legislature, of course, did not like putting money out for prisons. If you got a choice between supporting the LSU Tigers and supporting prisons, prisons are gonna lose every time. But not when you have Frank Palazzola saying, you know, if you don't if you don't give enough money for these prisons, I'll make you a defendant. Judge Palazzola's favorite three words were All Writs Act. And he figured he could he could bring anybody into this litigation under the All Writs Act. And he did. So uh, 
that's where we were. The state was not going to quit making inmates at that point, and population started to increase. And by 1981, we had a situation where in North Louisiana, you had federal district judges that were taking control of local prisons up there and saying, no more prisoners in our local jails. The Eastern District in New Orleans, um, you had Sheriff Foti housing a lot of state inmates that could not be transferred to Angola because of Judge Palazzolo's population caps, and same in Jefferson Parish and St. Bernard. So you had federal judges in the Eastern District that had imposed their own population caps. So we had a, we had a real conundrum at that point. Palazzolo said, you can't put them in Angola, and the local uh, the, the, the federal judges elsewhere said, you can't keep them here. So, so at one point, Judge, uh, Sheriff Foti actually filled up a bus full of, of inmates, took them to Hunt Correctional Facility and and handcuffed them to the gate and said, I'm not I can't keep them. My judge says I can't have them. Well, in 1981, a case called Hamilton versus Moriel came down out of the Fifth Circuit. And that made a huge difference. And it, it kind of leads me to where we're going with this consent decree business. Uh, Hamilton versus Morial said that Judge Palazzolo was to be prisoner central for the state of Louisiana. If it involved a capacity issue, a cap on a prison, then it had to go to Palazzolo for resolution. And with that, with that decision, suddenly Judge Palazzolo, and then by extension later, me, ended up with thousands and thousands and thousands of prisoners statewide. Uh, for which population caps were imposed. Now, where does that take us? In 1983, in 1983, the year, not the not the section, in 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 the year 1983, um, Judge Palazzola wrangled, arm twisted, population caps out of every facility, local facilities, state facilities. If it had a lock on it and a prisoner behind it, he got a court order out of that facility on a consent basis, on a voluntary basis, and that became a consent decree. That is what we call the consent decree we talk about today. And for many, many years, that rocked along. I cannot even start to tell you how big of an industry that ended up being. Uh, LSU had rooms devoted to producing reports for the judge. Every month after I got appointed, I would get a hand truck with at least four and sometimes six or eight boxes of data that, in, that came from all the prisons around the state. Um, so it was just a massive, a massive amount of data to, to try to consume. That rocked along fairly comfortably with reforms being made until the year 1990. And in 1990, something happened which kind of changed history. Uh, we had a sheriff in Avoyles Parish, Bill Belt, who later ended up in federal prison himself. Um, Bill Belt decided that he was going to make money by housing District of Columbia inmates who paid a higher per diem than the state inmates did. And once he did that, he figured Idaho inmates were also uh, good money. So he housed Idaho inmates and some Virginia inmates. And then INS inmates. And Judge Palazzolo said, where is the space going to be for Louisiana inmates if you're going to take all of these uh, out-of-state inmates? We litigated that for, I don't know, several years to the Fifth Circuit at least three times. And unfortunately, I got to say, I won one, I lost two. But the, one, the last one I lost was the most important, which meant that the sheriffs got to keep their, uh, their for pay inmates. So. That was the beginning of the end of the consent decree. 1994 comes along and the Prison Litigation Reform Act was implemented by Congress, which said that you had basically a two year limit on these consent decrees. After that, you had to basically have a new trial and show that the conditions were still in bad shape. Um, and that that just didn't that just didn't occur. So Angola stayed under consent decree till the year 2003 because we had filed a subsequent medical care case and a mental health care case. But the rest of the prisons, the state prisons and the parish and local prisons 
started easing out from under the consent decree between the years 2003, 2004, 2005. Another major factor in all of this was in 1992, Richard Stalder was, was named as uh, Secretary of the Department of Corrections. And he, he went to Judge Palazzolo with the idea of, look, we'll substitute American Correctional Association accreditation on state prisons from uh, for the, the consent decree. And that ended up being kind of where we went. The, the state uh, accredited all of its prisons and uh, that became the, the focus point for many years to, came, to come. Judge, Judge Palazzolo was categorically opposed to prison release orders. And some states used those, but, but Judge Palazzolo didn't, and he wouldn't. So uh, he always tried to get the state to fix the problem first, whatever the problem might be. So that, let me come back to the consent decree and mass incarceration. And where did that, where did that intersect? And how did it intersect? And I think that my answer after thinking about this a lot is that the consent decree, the prison reform cases, is probably a better way to put it, did not directly cause mass incarceration. But they, they did contribute in a sense that the consent decree did add a number of new beds. We went from about under 5,000 new beds to about 16,000, 17,000 state beds. And we did that by the year 1990. The local facilities, which Richard Stalder began to use to house excess prisoners over what the state could handle, were contractually uh, used under what was called a cooperative endeavor agreement a 20 year contract between the Department of Corrections and the local facility or the local sheriff to house X number of prisoners for X dollars per day or Y dollars per day. And those, those agreements to some degree exist to this day. And that's where we ended up with all the local facilities housing at some points more prisoners than the state facility did. So where did, where did the consent decree contribute? They added new prisons. They increased capacity through parish prisons. They maintained staffing ratios of uh, guards to inmates, which helped minimize some negative conditions. Um, even though the US Supreme Court in the relinquished years allowed double bunking, uh, we, we kind of avoided that until much later in the game, till in the 90s, late 90s. Uh, it helped maintain adequate medical and mental health care. It kept the legislature in line and the money flowing for a number of years. And it allowed the ACA to, um, the American Correctional Association, to become a proxy or a substitute for court control. I think the biggest success of the consent decree as regards mass incarceration is that the consent decree kept conditions at least marginally constitutional in the local facilities for many years and fairly constitutional in the state facilities. Um, and finally, there was something called the basic jail guidelines, which were implemented uh, in the mid 1990s that provided a very nominal set of, of guidelines for local and parish jails to follow which helped because before that, there was nothing else. So I started this with a question, uh, was who was Hayes Williams and why should you care? And the rest of the Hayes Williams story uh, in terms of, of what happened is, uh, I, I talked to Hayes many, many, many times over the years while he was incarcerated. In 1997, because of uh, a Brady violation, he was released from Angola. He was an Orleans Parish prisoner, and he was released from Angola. And he survived quite well for the next three years, at which point he was shot in a street fight and died. Uh, it, it died on the street. So at least he died a free man. So that's where I am. And that's what that's the history I lived uh, in a short order. So thank you. And I'll take any questions when they come up.
Thank you so much for your presentation and for that history. I actually haven't heard that story told that way. And so it's very interesting to kind of hear it repeated back in, uh, yeah, makes a lot of sense. Um, right now the Q&A is open. So if anyone has any questions, please put them in the Q&A for any of the panelists. Um, we have about 15 minutes for discussion. Um, so I'm hoping we can get into at least a couple of the issues. If y'all don't have questions, I have questions for everyone. So, <laughs> um, so but I see that there's a few coming in. Let's see. Um, here's one that seems like it might be might be quicker, but maybe not. Is uh, in the case that women are, is it the case that women are far less likely to be able to claim self-defense in manslaughter or attempted manslaughter manslaughter cases? Does anyone have any information about um, women? claiming self-defense and manslaughter cases. Candace, I know you talked about that. Do you want to touch on that? Um, thank you, Annie. So the case with that is that in the state of Louisiana, women are not able to claim self-defense as it is not a instituted in the law here in Louisiana. Crimes can be classified as a justifiable homicide where they can be sentenced to manslaughter or possibly negligent homicide, but self-defense is not something they can claim. I think one thing I would add to that um, I learned from the Women's Prison Project at the Tulane uh, University Law School is, is that um, this idea of stand your ground, you know, obviously a lot of states, including Louisiana, have this like robust idea of stand your ground, protect your, protect the castle. Um, but that is really interpreted through a gendered lens. And so, you know, men who are protecting private property or protecting their own, their own home, I think are often better able to avail themselves of that law. But uh, women who are, you know, who sort of don't fit the stereotype of the people who, you know, will protect the castle um, don't don't sort of get the benefit of that law in the same way. Thank you for that context as well. Uh, Tammy, I see you have a question. Um, can an attorney promise their clients anything or is that against an oath you take? Fittish, do you want to respond to that? You know, it's a good question. Um, I think it, uh, I don't know if there's a specific ethical, uh, uh, I'd have to think about it. Um, I, I would say that it's a practice, uh, most, uh, as far as I know, most attorneys don't make those kinds of promises. Um, but one thing that I have learned um, that has been really interesting for me as I've been in this longer, uh, been in this career longer is that, you know, representing incarcerated folks, uh, especially as a young attorney, I thought it was my job to tell them all the ways that we were going to lose the case because I wanted to make sure that they didn't have inflated expectations about what could happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have since uh, learned that, you know, people in prison need hope. Um, and obviously having a lawyer is one way to get hope, but um, having a lawyer who isn't coming to the prison to tell you constantly that the courts are terrible, that you're going to lose on this claim and this claim and this way, because this is how, you know, courts rule in these cases um, can really be damaging and difficult for people. Um, and so I, I don't think, you know, lawyers in general should and do make promises of specific outcomes. Um, it's kind of, it's not appropriate and, and arguably unethical, but I do think that um, we could be better about, you know, acknowledging what our clients are going through. Thank you for that answer. Alana, there's a question for you um, about your time as an ADA. And I think this kind of touches on the progressive prosecutor, my baby wants to talk too, but the progressive prosecutor um, kind of subject that you brought up. So, you know, where, you know, there, this person's asking about social impact, what's more impact being a public defender or a prosecutor. And I think a lot of people are asking, young people in law school are asking themselves this question um, as there is this wave of progressive DAs and prosecutors. Can you speak to that? Sure. I absolutely think that um, there's an, a real necessity to have folks committed to ending mass incarceration and eliminating racial disparity in the criminal legal system on both sides. And with the you know, increased involvement of people who have um, criminal defense attorney backgrounds running for elected office, uh, who have worked either as public defenders, uh, who have been otherwise kind of very deeply involved in representing people's interests who have been justice impacted. That's the most important thing. Um, and of course, you can see now that, I mean, it, it's a pretty clear case why public defense matters, but 
I mean, sitting here listening to Biddish and, you know, knowing the incredible work that's happening here in Orleans and in many other states around the nation, the case for progressive prosecution is, is even more, uh, is even more significant. So, you know, I will continue to say this, and this point is still very true. Having someone in a line prosecutor position um, when you don't have leadership at the um, at the level of, you know, the elected level or, uh, you know, the the district attorney, him or herself being someone committed to those principles is really difficult. So I worked as a line prosecutor under a very draconian um prosecutor, uh, Leon Canizero, and it was incredibly difficult to make, you know, systemic reform change. Um, but I would, I, I absolutely would recommend, you know, I, I don't think I would have been able to see um, and understand the criminal legal system in the way that I do, but for my time at the DA's office. And I don't think I would have been as well versed in some of the harms and the ways in which, um, you know, discretion and, and statutes work to harm people, but for that experience. And so it's very, it's very hard for me to encourage young people to go and work in offices where um, they would potentially be kind of contributing to this kind of harm. Uh, but I also exactly hold up, you know, my experience and say that, you know, it, it was seminal to, to where I am today and helping me um, understand how to help counteract some of these laws. So incredibly important to work in offices uh, that already kind of embrace that philosophy, but it is important to, to understand the system period. And if you can, um, I think part of the thing also is that in, in our generation, folks, I think expect to have five to seven different career, you know, uh, opportunities that they avail themselves of. So you don't have to do this work for five or 10 or 15 years. Um, you can, you know, think of it as a fellowship, you know, and spend a couple of years learning, really deeply learning and pushing, right? I mean, there is nothing that prevents you from pushing against the system and for advocating for change, no matter where you sit in that system. And I, I did that very often as a line prosecutor. I wasn't always successful, but it was something that I really learned how to do. So I would definitely advocate for people to, um, to learn as many angles of this system as you possibly can. Thank you for your answer. I am looking at this question about, um, if housing state prison, people in state prisons uh, to serve sentences in local jails should be illegal. And I, I'm interested in your response to that. And then I'm also interested kind of in Mr. Nordak, you brought up basically in giving us this history, some of the unintended or perhaps intended consequences of some of these reforms over the years in increasing the size of prisons. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, as we make more laws, to correct laws, um, should we be taking this step around? Oh, hello, baby. All around local jails. Okay. And um, and is there any possible intended or unintended consequence from from maybe making a law that encourages people to be in state prisons? Could that lead to building more state prisons, or how do we really actually get at decarceration? Um, and then I guess, Mr. Nordyke, I'll throw that to you first and then uh, anyone else who would like to comment. Okay. Let, let me start by saying I am not a fan of locking up people in local facilities for long sentences. I don't think that's what they were built for. I don't think that's what they should be used for. They are usually for pretrial incarceration. And I think that's what we should do. Having said that, we made a turn back in 1992, basically, to do this. And I don't know how you unring the bell. Uh, I opposed it. I opposed it three times in the U.S. Fifth Circuit in 1990 through 93 or four. And I won one, I lost two. And the bottom line is, and rich were denied. So there's nothing I can do about that. The state has the right to house prisoners in parish facilities. There are some parish facilities that do it far better than others. And I, I can name those that do it well, and I can name those that don't do it so well. Um, but I, I've, I've almost given up trying. So let me get to the second part of your question. And that is, what do we do about it? Um, I don't think we need to forbid people from housing prisoners. 
if that's where the state has to house them. I think the answer is the journey that we've been on since 2017. And that is we lower the population to where they are, where the parish facilities are not needed to house state prisoners. The educational opportunities, the vocational opportunities, the rehabilitation opportunities are so much greater in, in the state facilities that that's where our people ought to be. The research we did in the TIGER program, I think, led us clearly to the, to the realization that if we, if we treat people, and I mean treat in the way that a physician would treat a patient, if we provide a prescription to uh, folks in prison, education, a way to make a living and so forth, we just won't need as many beds. So that's my short answer. And the, the second thing I'll say on that is that since 2017, I mean, God bless Jimmy LeBlanc. He's done a remarkable job with bringing the population down. And the, the, the place that you see it the most is in the lower number of folks in, in the local private facilities. You know, that's, I can go on for hours, but I'll stop at that one. Thank you. Does anyone else want to speak to that or maybe even just like unintended intended consequences of uh, reform? Um, maybe as we kind of close up the Q&A for this panel, we've got about four minutes left. Um, how, I guess I'll, I'll just extend that question again is, you know, how do we avoid unintended consequences from changing the laws that have created the system that we have? Um, Alana, do you want to speak to that to start? And and maybe Candace and Biddish, you can also weigh in um, with some final thoughts. Yeah, before I offered a final thought, I wanted to say something about um, folks serving time in um, local jail facilities and versus, um, and the ways in which people are um, essentially kind of traded throughout the state. One of the harms that we're starting to see, which is, this is not a new issue, is folks that are taken from their communities and moved to facilities, sometimes DOC facilities, even when individuals are pretrial. And uh, they're taken out of their communities and have very little access to attorneys and are prevented, of course, from seeing their family members and friends uh, and actually being connected to community because they are in remote facilities around the state. Um, this is happening and, and it even happens for folks who are, uh, or, like I said, incarcerated pretrial. So they are still legally innocent, still folks who um, have yet to receive potentially charge and have not, certainly not received a trial, but um, are, are just because they have not made bond, just because they don't have the money to be able to bond themselves out are, you know, moved around. And I think we, we have such an intricate network of jails um, and the relationship between the, the, you know, local facilities and DOC. Those are some relationships I think that really have to be um, given a bit more scrutiny, what those relationships are and the ways in which people are, are moved uh, because there are some constitutional issues that exist when people don't have access to counsel adequately, they cannot participate in their own defense, and they are, um, in some instances, in some cases, also not being released uh, when they're being ordered released because they're being lost in the system. So that could obviously, of course, be a whole uh, presentation unto itself. But I will, I'll move past that and I'll, I'll say that I'm so grateful for the work that is being done um, um, in New Orleans. I think many times we get an incredibly bad rap in New Orleans uh, for being one of the parishes that has traditionally and historically contributed to high rates of incarceration in the state, simply by way of population, but also by way of policies and practices. But now we are actually doing an about face in that regard. And we are really, and I love what Biddish said about being progressive and that the, the, the connotation there is how can we look forward to envision and to create policies that create change, but while simultaneously looking behind and looking 
to repair the harm. So repairing the harm with backward looking, you know, remedial measures, and then looking forward with progressive uh, policies. And we're in, inc we, we face incredible headwind at this time. We've, we've been really committed to doing this work. And now we face uh, the headwind of increasing rates of crime and how do we stay grounded and really intentional about policies that we know uh, reduce rates of incarceration, reduce racial disparity uh, in the midst of cries, of course, of many, many people who are, who are really concerned about public safety, as am I. This is the time that we actually have to be most faithful to the research and to the evidence. And I really just am very grateful for the work that is going on, um, especially in Orleans Parish, because I think that is really a model for what should happen in the rest of the state. Thank you, Alana. I wanna acknowledge that we're at time, but I still wanna give folks time to make final comments. So I appreciate um, people who can stay a few more minutes. Um, Candice, do you have any final thoughts to contribute to the conversation? Uh, yes. So, um, of course, I am not a fan of being housed in local facilities simply because, especially here in northern Louisiana, the housing is at a great disadvantage for women and there are the opportunities missed for educational resources as well as to be able to defend yourself legally for those legal resources. However, there are the drawbacks of not being able to see one's family members and being taken so far away because my family had to travel five hours just to come see me and they were only able to come see me maybe once a month. And so that is a big drawback and even with the educational resources that are there at the state facilities coming back up north, the chances of finding a job with those opportunities are very slim if it were not for the doctors and the teachers that helped me while I was down south, I would not be in a position to have the job opportunities that I do have. So as far as being housed in local facilities, I'm not a fan. But again, I say there are those drawbacks. Thank you. Thank you, Candice. Fidish, close us out. <laughs> Um, just on the question of unintended consequences, I, I think the thought that came to mind uh, is something that Alana mentioned earlier, which is that, you know, we've it, uh, at various points uh, during reform efforts, we've made an artificial distinction between nonviolent and violent offenses. And I think uh, advocates at times have been quick to leave behind folks who have, uh, you know, uh, convictions for violent offenses. And, and I think we're evolving past that, but I would just encourage people to uh, maybe get rid of that distinction because I do think it is pretty artificial and under-inclusive um, in, in really problematic ways. Um, I think it's really easy for people now to give lip service to the idea that we're going to reform and address mass incarceration by, you know, constantly trying to um, decriminalize nonviolent offenses or lesser the punishments, but at the same time get harsher and more punitive on violent offenses. And I realize it's probably not a popular thing to say, especially when uh, crime is turning the way it is, uh, as Alana mentioned too, but, um, you know, it gets back to the point of uh, punishing somebody, uh, uh, making sure that people are held accountable is different than sending someone to prison for the rest of their lives. Those are two very different things. And I, I think we can have that conversation and we should be having that conversation as opposed to a conversation about uh, let's stop putting people in prison for, you know, walking around smoking a joint. I, I think we need to move past that. Well, thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you to the attendees and thank you to the panelists. Uh, I really enjoyed the presentations today and I look forward to connecting again on, on this work. Thank you. <laughs>